Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Institute for Work and Health uh, speaker series. We're delighted to have you join us today. And um, I'm, I'm very happy to have two speakers this morning, Dr. Nancy Carnide and Dr. Paul Demers, who will be speaking to you. Um, before I introduce them more fully, I just want to run through a couple of pieces of housekeeping with you. Um, you do have closed captioning available to you. It's on the bottom of your screen, and you can activate that if you want to use it. Um, we also um, welcome your comments and your questions. Um, we'll be taking those at the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, please type it in the Q&A box um, and I'll be monitoring those and I will try to get through uh, everyone's questions. Um, I also wanna let you know that um, this is our last uh, speaker series of the season. We're gonna take a little um, hiatus in July and August and we'll be back in September with more terrific talks. So let me go ahead and introduce our two speakers to you today. Uh, we have Dr. Nancy Cardi. She is an associate scientist at the Institute for Work and Health. She conducts research at the intersection between occupational health and safety and substance use. Her program of research includes examining the use and non uh, the use and non medical use of prescription and recreational drugs among workers, their risk factors, and the workplace consequences of their use, with a focus on cannabis and opioids. We also have Dr. Paul Demers joining us. He is the director of the Occupational Cancer Research Center based at Ontario Health. He's also a professor at the Dalhousie School of Public Health at the University of Toronto and a clinical professor in the School of Population and Public, uh, Public Health at the University of British Columbia. He is an epidemiologist whose research focuses on the causes and prevention of a wide range of occupational diseases. I'm gonna turn it over to you both and then um, I'll be back for the question and answer. Again, um, if you have questions, please type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Monique. Uh, so Paul and I are happy to be here today to um, present some of the findings emerging from our study on opioid-related harms among workers in the occupational disease surveillance system. So first, I'd like to acknowledge the project team. So this project is a collaboration between the Institute uh, for Work and Health and the Occupational Cancer Research Center at Ontario Health. I'd also like to acknowledge that this project has been funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada and the Occupational Disease Surveillance System, which we use in this uh, study, was established with the support of the Ontario Workplace Safety and Insurance Board, the Ministry of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development, and the Ministry of Health. And finally, I'd also just like to acknowledge our project advisory committee that has been providing guidance to us throughout this project. So this committee includes uh, labor and workplace representatives, public health, substance use experts, and the Ontario WSIB and Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. So I hope you're able to stay for the entirety of the presentation, um, but if you're not, I'm going to start off by telling you what the key messages are from our analyses. So we examined a large group of workers in Ontario who all previously had an accepted lost time workers compensation claim for a work related injury or illness. When we compared this group of workers to the general Ontario population, we found that the rates of two key opioid related harms poisonings and mental and behavioral disorders were significantly higher compared to the general population, which, which we believe lends support to the hypothesized role of work-related injuries as a contributor to opioid-related harms. In that external comparison with the general Ontario population, as well as in internal comparisons within the group of workers in the ODSS, we also found that certain occupational groups demonstrated higher risks of opioid related harms. And this was particularly true for occupations that we traditionally consider blue collar and physically demanding. So on to our uh, bit of background to this study. Uh, so as I'm sure many of you are aware, North America has been facing an unprecedented public health crisis related to opioid related poisonings which has only worsened in the last few years. Here in Canada, between January 2016 and September 2022, there were over 34,000 opioid-related deaths. And males of working age, particularly those between the ages of 30 and 49, 
have been disproportionately affected. And this has led to interest in understanding why we are seeing these patterns, including interest in the role of occupation. So most of what is known about the role of occupation has come from studies in the US, several of which have demonstrated occupational patterns in opioid related deaths. And these are just some of the examples on the left hand side. Across these studies, opioid related poisonings have been uh, particularly prominent among those in construction and trades, natural resources, transportation, maintenance, healthcare, and services. In Canada, data on employment among those affected have, has been relatively sparse, and the limited data on occupation that we do have um, has come from coroner data. So this was um, a report out of BC that found that among the opioid-related deaths in 2016 to 2017, 24% of individuals were employed at the time of death. Among those individuals, most were employed in trades and transport at the time of death, followed by sales and service and natural resources and agriculture. Here in Ontario, the most recent data comes from March to December 2019 and March to December 2020, where they looked at patterns um, before and after the pandemic. And so when we look at the occupational patterns among those employed at the time of death, we see that many of the same groups, um, we see many of the same groups with, with higher, um, uh, that are disproportionately affected by deaths with construction topping the list. And essentially there was no change between pre and post pandemic. But it's also important, I think, to highlight the extent to which employment information is available in these data. So this is looking at industry of work among those that were employed at the time of death. But as you can see here, about 16% were missing information on their industry of work. And when we go backwards and we look more generally at employment status, we see that about 13 to 16% of those who died were known to be employed, um, which that's the group that, were, that made up the previous table on industry. But among all opioid related deaths investigated by the coroner, about a third had an unknown employment status. So that's the bars on the uh, very right hand side. And then even among those who were unemployed at the time of death, which was about half, we have no information on history of employment or occupation. So our project team has been trying to address these gaps by adapting an existing resource, the Occupational Disease Surveillance System, to monitor opioid related harms in the Ontario workforce. So for today's presentation, we will, we will be presenting the findings of two particular analyses. The first is an analysis in which we have compared the rates of opioid related harms among workers in the ODSS to those in the general Ontario population, overall and by occupation. And the second is an internal analysis where we have examined the association between occupation and risk of opioid related harms among workers within the ODSS. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Paul and he'll take you through the methods and the findings. Thanks, Nancy, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, today about, uh, I guess starting by talking about uh, the Occupational Disease Surveillance System. This is a system that we originally developed uh, to look at cancers and then many other occupational diseases. And so we've really expanded the use of it to a wide range and opioids is uh, one of the most recent examples of that. Um, it, I want to acknowledge as part of this that uh, we were funded for all this work through the Ontario Ministry of Labor and Immigration Training and Skills Development and the Ontario Ministry of Health that uh, actually supports the ongoing work of surveillance of our center, even though we're called the Occupational Cancer Research Center, uh, which is how we were created, uh, we do look at a wide variety of diseases. The system itself uh, is uh, has work on uh, as data on over 2.3 million uh, workers, uh, but today we're really going to be concentrating on the results for one point, approximately 1.7 million workers. Do you want to flip to the next slide, please, Nancy? Um, the folks that are in this uh, system are all former WSIB time loss claimants, uh, and that's important um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is and it's something to keep in mind when you're 
uh, looking at this, the results of this analysis, is that we don't have the entire labor force here. What we've got is uh, really a skewed or a kind of a, a group that really is primarily uh, folks who are in higher risk uh, or high hazard occupations, I would call them. They're people who were uh, injured on the job uh, serious enough to have time loss uh, days there. Uh, it's a very large population, uh, but still it doesn't include as many, let's say, office workers or teachers as it would uh, industrial workers or miners or construction workers. Still, it does give us a lot of power to look at a wide variety of different groups. The other thing to remember that I think is particularly important for uh, this study is that these folks were all injured at work in one way or another, mostly through uh, through kind of acute injuries or uh, musculoskeletal injuries, some through diseases as well, but um, primarily uh, people who uh, were injured at work because it's a hazardous, hazardous workplace. But because they're injured, that has implications for how we interpret the data. Can I have the next slide, please? There we go. Um, so here you see uh, uh, what we start off with, which is our approximately 1.7 million workers. We actually initially try to link everybody in the cohort um, to our health records in the province of Ontario. Could you have the next piece of the pie, please? And we do that through linking to, the thing, to a thing called the Registered Persons Database, which is a database that has everybody in it who has um, a health uh, number here in the province. Uh, and that allows us then to link to the other health records uh, that will allow us to identify opioid-related harms. So if I could have the next. And in order to look at opioid-related harms, we're looking at both uh, people who have been hospitalized, and also people who show up at uh, emergency rooms uh, in the province. So we're using two different databases. For those of you who are, who are familiar with these, uh, one is the Discharge Abstract Database, which is uh, for the hospitalizations and the National Ambulatory Care Reporting System for the emergency room visits. Both of these are available to us from 2006 forward. And the analyses that we're going to present today go through 2020. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, there are two different opioid related uh, categories of opioid related harms that were uh, mentioned earlier. Um, we're identifying them uh, based upon uh, the ICD codes that are, are um, coded when somebody has an encounter with our healthcare system. Um, but we'll be presenting results separately for poisoning and mental and behavioral disorders. Uh, but what you see here is uh, the number of uh, events that we've seen. So these are the number of poisonings and the number of uh, um, encounters with either a hospital or the emergency room for mental and behavioral disorders. And then the number of people uh, that those are impacted with. And that makes uh, a bit of a difference. But what it means is that some people end up being um, showing up in the healthcare system multiple times for poisonings, uh, which will uh, not surprise, I think, some people. Um, one thing that we don't have here, which will come up later as a limitation to this uh, study, is uh, we are not looking at people who uh, died immediately from a poisoning. Uh, we're really looking at people they had to survive to get uh, into the healthcare system at least long enough for that, even though they may have uh, uh, died subsequent to that. Can I have the next slide, please? So for the first analysis, what we're doing is comparing uh, the people in our surveillance system uh, to the general population of Ontario. Uh, and uh, that's important because it gives us uh, kind of an idea of, of how our, our population, because it isn't the general population, how they compare to the rest of, of Ontario. Um, uh, but uh, it's only kind of one view on this. Now, what we have to do when we're doing this is we uh, adjust all of our comparisons by uh, the age and the sex, but also the region, because uh, we know that opioid-related harms vary by region of the province. So we're trying to give a very uh, 
well-adjusted comparison between the two places. Can I have the next slide, please? And this, in this first analysis, what we're using are what are called standardized incidence ratios. So we're looking at the rates um, that people have uh, opioid-related poisonings and mental and behavioral disorders uh, um, compared to the general population, what we would expect if uh, among people who were the same age, sex, and re region. Um, and we're looking at both hospitalizations and emergency department visits, um, but uh, we're looking overall, and then we're also looking by division level. Uh, and division level uh, is uh, the way that we kind of uh, code the occupation and industry data that we get from the WSIB. Uh, division level is the highest level, and that's about 20 different occupational groups. Can I have the next slide, please? So these are the overall uh, results. This is the number of uh, the standardized incidence ratio for poisonings and for uh, mental and behavioral uh, disorders. And the way you interpret this as an SIR, for those of you who've seen other kind of epidemiologic uh, presentations, is a measure of relative risk. So an SIR of one means it's similar to the general population, and anything greater than that means that it's higher than the general population. So uh, the risk of poisonings in our group that show up in emergency departments is 2.4 times higher uh, than the general population. Um, and then hospitalizations roughly one and a half times higher, uh, a little bit lower, but still elevated for mental and behavioral disorders overall. And um, all of these are statistically significant results for those of you who are interested. Let's go to the next slide, please. Now, I apologize for the size here. The idea here is not to look at the specific groups, and I'll talk about some of the particularly high-risk groups, but it's just that um, in these results to show that most of our different occupational groups were elevated compared to the general population. Uh, just to explain this, we're looking at emergency department visits on the left, hospitalizations on the right, and both of these are for poisonings compared to the general population. The horizontal bar is what we call a 95% confidence limit. So it represents the fact that uh, there can be some statistical variability in comparing our results to the general population, or uh, you'll see later comparing internally as well. But it gives you the range within that is that appears with 95% confidence. So what you see here is that with a kind of a glaring exception of teaching and related uh, groups that have a lower risk, almost all the groups are elevated at both the, for both the emergency department visits and hospitalizations. The overall result is that little one at the very bottom that has the very tight confidence limits because it's based upon very large numbers. The width of those confidence limits is based upon the size of the group because the smaller the group, the more it can vary. Can I go to the next slide, please? This is the same results for mental and behavioral disorders. And here you see that, uh, again, most of the groups are elevated, but not all of the groups in this case. Um, so you see a few more groups falling below. Uh, teaching and related is certainly at the bottom uh, of this still. Um, and the risks are, again, uh, higher when you look at emergency department visits versus hospitalizations, which is an overall pattern that we see. But again, it's just to give you that kind of high level picture. And I'll talk about some of the specific groups in just a moment. Can I go to the next slide, please? So these are some of the groups that we saw most consistently elevated. And again, this is uh, um, not, we have about 20 different groups that we looked at. Uh, at this stage in this analysis, um, construction, material handling, uh, this processing group is really kind of, uh, you can think of them as manufacturing workers that deal with minerals, metal and chemical products, machining, transport, mining, um, but as well 
even kind of different medicine or medical related occupations uh, that includes nurses uh, and different service occupations also appeared elevated. And so we'll give you some more specific results for that a little bit in a few minutes. Could I have the next slide, please? So this next analysis is comparing the ODSS uh, to just groups within the ODSS to other groups within the ODSS. So it's kind of, instead of comparing to the general population, we're looking just within this large population. And it tells us which occupations are particularly at high risk um, comparing to other folks who are fairly similar. So these are people who have workers' compensation insurance uh, and did file claims uh, successfully within the workers' compensation system. So we think that we're looking at this compared to a very similar group, uh, but you'll see that the relative risks or here measured as hazard ratios are not as high. Can we go to the next slide, please? So here we're using a different type of statistical analysis. For those of you who are aware of these kind of things, we're using Cox proportional hazards models. Uh, but the important thing is that what we're calculating here are hazard ratios, which are, again are a measure of relative risk. So a hazard ratio of one is similar. So it means that it's similar to the average of the entire group of the ODSS versus an elevated one means that it's higher than overall the average for the ODSS. And here we're adjusting for age, uh, sex, uh, length of follow-up, and birth year. And we're looking at three different occupational levels. Um, the, uh, here is the division level uh, results. And you see many of the same groups that we saw um, overall when we were comparing to the general population. And I'll explain this slide a little bit here. Um, so you see construction trades. The P is for poisonings. The MB is for mental and behavioral disorders. The first number there is the hazard ratio. So uh, over 50% higher for both of those outcomes when we look at the construction trades. And then you see the 95% uh, confidence limits that are there. So that's the range within we, we think that the actual risks is. Um, and you see that for all of these, uh, the risk is uh, elevated for both uh, poisonings and mental and behavioral disorders, forestry and logging, uh, material handling, which is, uh, occurs in a number of different industries. These two processing groups are different types of uh, generally of manufacturing workers. Um, highest risk in these groups that we saw before for mineral, metal, and chemical workers, less so for food, wood, and textile workers, where there's a smaller elevated risk, and then for machining workers. But remember that the interpretation here is this is compared to all other groups within the ODSS. Um, and if we're comparing to the general population, they would be somewhat higher. Can I go to the next slide, please? But that was at this division level, and that's the 20 different groups. Uh, the next level is the major level, and here we've got many more different groups. So within construction trades, we have three different other fairly large groups, um, and we don't always see the same risk in each of the different uh, groups. So you see um, there were an elevated risk in excavating, grading, and paving, um, a, a somewhat lower, or actually, a, lower than uh, risk than the overall ODSS for electrical uh, related trades. The other construction trades is really many of the different construction groups that we consider, you know, when we think about construction, you know, people who are, you know, carpenters and uh, painters and other groups like that. And overall, they have almost an 80% increased risk of both uh, poisonings and mental and behavioral disorders. Go to the next slide, please. We also see that there's a lot of different different risks when you start to dig down further within machining. So we don't see an elevated risk at all. We actually see a decreased risk in metal machining. But in some groups like you know metal uh, shaping and forming, uh, we do see an elevated risk. 
What you also see here is that not every group that has a high risk of poisonings or a high risk of mental and behavioral disorders has the same risk for both, both opioid related harms. Um, so when you look at uh, other machining uh, related jobs, you see a 25% increased risk for poisonings, but less so for uh, mental and behavioral disorders. For the next slide, please. Um, another couple of groups that I mentioned were uh, mining and quarrying um, and transport uh, equipment operating. Um, here you see uh, uh, poisonings is not so elevated, but remember, these are poisonings that would have to get to a hospital or to some kind of emergency department. Uh, and it could be that when you're in a more isolated industry, um, your chances of getting, you know, being successfully transported there might be less. And then transport equipment operating. I'll give you a few detailed results for them as well. Next slide. The interesting thing here with uh, transport and equipment operating is what you see is a really kind of a lot of variability. Um, really quite high risks in water transport, even though there's not a huge number of people in there, um, but very high risk for poisonings. Uh, and a significantly lower risk for air transport, which for those of you who fly, you might feel better about that. But um, what we're seeing here is very, very different risks between these different groups um, with motor transport uh, uh, kind of groups having a small elevated risk across the board. Can I go to the next slide, please? And this is my last slide of results. And I'll I'll say here that we've really looked at many, many different groups and uh, Nancy will talk in a, a few minutes just about um, how we can uh, see, uh, dig down into looking at those things with our online tools that are there. But we do see an increased risk in medicine and health, but here the uh, elevated risk was really nursing aides and orderlies. Services is a very broad group um, and you see a lot of different uh, groups. Some are elevated, some are have a decreased risk. Um, and we have listed a few of the service groups here that are elevated. But with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, Nancy to take us to the, uh, to the final piece here. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna bring us back to that original slide that I had presented at the beginning with our key findings. And so I think one of the things, as Paul mentioned, to keep in mind is that the unifying factor among workers in the ODSS is that they all had a previous workers' compensation claim. And so the results of our external comparison to the general population certainly provide support to the hypothesis that work-related injuries have a role to play in this public health crisis, which has something um, that has, is, is a fairly prominent hypothesis in this space. Um, this is also supported by many of the occupational groups that have been found to be at higher risk of opioid related harms as they tend to be physically demanding. And overall, I think uh, these results provide an important signal for which subgroups of the workforce uh, where prevention and harm reduction activities can be targeted to reduce those harms. So for the next few slides, I'm just going to elaborate a little bit more about the potential role of work in the development of, of opioid related harms. Um, but keeping in mind that there is little research data available yet to fully unpack why we are seeing these findings. And so most of these are just hypotheses. Now the role of work related injuries, as I said, is perhaps one of the main hypotheses for which we do have some data. So when it comes to work related injuries, we know that they frequently result in pain and functional interference, and that can make it more likely that workers will use opioids to try and alleviate those symptoms. And in fact, there is a large body of literature available that has demonstrated opioid prescribing to be common after work-related injuries. There are also complicating factors of poor mental health that can occur after an injury, as well as the many potential challenges of returning to work that can make it more likely that a worker may use opioids. This includes pressures to return after injury, lack of appropriate workplace accommodations, insufficient sick leave, and return to work isn't always linear. So there could be starts and stops, and those interruptions in employment can also affect mental health and be a risk factor for the development of a substance use disorder. 
So the findings that we presented today from the external comparison analyses contribute to the very small but emerging body of literature providing support for the role of work-related injuries. So this study out of the US conducted a very similar comparison in which they compared rates of deaths among workers' compensation claimants with low back injuries to the general population. And they looked at uh, different causes of death. But what they, oh, sorry. But what they also found was that um, workers, workers' compensation claimants had a significantly elevated rate of death due to poisonings among, uh, due to poisonings. And this was particularly true uh, for those with lost time claims or with permanent disability. Uh, as far as I'm aware, there's only uh, been one study um, that's been published to date that has compared workers after a work injury with a group of non-injured workers. And the results um, of this particular study demonstrate that those with work injuries have a higher risk of experiencing an opioid-related death than um, non-injured workers. And so this was seen whether the injury was sort of a medical only injury or resulted in lost time, although the risk was highest for those with work loss. Beyond the role for workplace injuries, there are other potential hypothesized reasons from at least a workplace perspective for why certain occupational groups may be at higher risk. So many of the occupational groups identified in our study and in others um, are typically male dominated. And that can mean that there are certain um, gendered norms in the workplace, you know, about showing strength and about working through pain, which could be a contributing factor. Some industries and workplaces may also be more normative when it comes to substance use in the workplace. So uh, where it's considered more commonplace and accepted among workers. I think we also need to think about whether there are certain aspects of the work environment that could be contributing. So beyond physical demands, things like psychological and time demands of jobs, how much control workers have over their work, the degree of support they may be receiving in the workplace, and how isolated the work is, um, or how much supervision an individual might have. Um, and finally, I think it's important to consider whether concerns about disclosure are playing a role. So workers may not be forthcoming about either their pain or their substance use due to concerns about stigma and the consequences that they may face at work if they do disclose that information. And you can particularly think about this in a safety sensitive um, environment. And this can potentially exacerbate issues that the worker is facing. Um, so finally, uh, before we end today, I just want to briefly tell you about um, a data visualization tool that we are developing from this project. So the goal in producing this tool uh, was to allow members of the public, particularly individuals and organizations looking for data on opioid related harms from an occupational context, um, the ability to access information from within the ODSS to better understand patterns of opioid related harms in this group of workers, as well as the characteristics of those experiencing harms. So this tool will allow uh, users to create graphs of cases and rates of opioid related hospitalizations and emergency department visits that have occurred among workers in the ODSS from 2006 to 2020. Uh, we're developing three dashboards, so uh, one for each of the opioid-related harms um, that we are looking at in this project. So the poisonings, mental and behavioral disorders, and another group that we didn't present on today, adverse drug effects, which are essentially reactions to prescribed medication. And within each of the dashboards, um, there will be a series of tabs that will allow users to create custom graphs according to uh, year, age, sex, region in Ontario, and course, occupation and industry. So we are hoping to launch the data visualization tool this summer on our project website. The URL is um, listed here on the slide. Um, so if you want to be uh, the first to know um, when it does launch, uh, we do encourage you to sign up for updates on our project website. So at the moment, you can sign up at either one of these two spots um, or on the data visualization page itself, which is circled there. So thank you very much uh, for your attention today and we're happy to take questions now.
Okay, thank you very much, both of you, for a really terrific presentation. We do have a number of questions, so we'll do our best to get through them all. Um, and um, just want to encourage anyone who has a question, if it doesn't get answered, to please reach out directly to Nancy and Paul. Um, and um, if you do have questions, comments, uh, feel free to add them to the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your screen. So to start us off, um, uh, just a question of clarification from someone. When you say the general population, so you compared um, your findings to the general population, um, is that the general working population or is that um, everybody over 15 or uh, does it include children, retired people? Who is in the general population? Well, it includes everybody. It is the general population. It isn't. We don't have information in our uh, on every uh, person's uh, uh, status or you know employment status or anything like that when it comes to looking at uh, calculating disease rates in the uh, in the province. It's simply uh, something we don't have, um, and it. Uh, so, but I'll, I'll say that it's. What, what the actual way this comparison is done is it's trying to look at uh, the number of expected cases uh, among people with the same age, sex, uh, region, um, and those are the three pr primary things that we're <laughs> adjusting for. And what that means is that, no, we're not really comparing to children. And uh, we might have some retired people in here, but there's some also some retired people, uh, you know, older people in the overall ODSS because we've been following this folk, these folks for a long time. Um, so we are, um, we are uh, uh, somewhat, we narrowed it a bit in that case. Um, also, there was another related question about other differences, and it's it's true that we also don't know anything about not just um, we don't know the people's employment status, but we don't know socioeconomic status and things like that. We just have um, these are the overall disease rates of the uh, of the general population, as we would have like in studies of cancer, where you're looking at the risk of cancer and other things like that. Sorry, okay. just to really also say yep. that we did we did at least look at working the working age similar to what we have in the ODSS from 15 to 65. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and this is related. I, I and you I think answered part of it, but um, I want to um, ask the full question and, you know, so that uh, I don't miss anything. Um, do you think that the adjustment for age, section, region makes the ODSS and the general general population really comparable? Uh, for example, do you know if there are differences by current employment status, current income, or occupation and industry between the ODSS and the general population that might explain the elevated risks even after um, you've adjusted? Um, and the individual has suggested that unemployment in particular seems to be a driver of opioid risk in the information presented at the very start of the presentation. Yeah, and as I just said, we don't have employment status and we don't have socioeconomic status. I, I'm going to say that I, you know, it is, we do have a broad range of the, uh, of the labor force um, and people who are, uh, who have workers' compensation coverage or we're overrepresenting the unionized population uh, and groups like that. So we're probably, uh, I'm not sure exactly how we compare, but uh, we're probably missing people at both the low and the high end of the uh, socioeconomic uh, spectrum. When we're doing these kind of comparisons uh, but that's another reason why we try to do both these external and what we call the external analysis compared to the general population and the uh the internal analysis comparing to other people within the odss um, i'm sorry nancy i shouldn't be just jumping in and, and I should check in with you about who should answer. no it's totally fine <laughs> did you have anything to add nancy no, I, I mean, I think it's just it's it's the limitation of administrative data. Um, mm -hmm. We only have so many characteristics that we can look at. And, and again, this is sort of that starting point um, for an area that we really have very little research, um, but certainly has provided some pretty strong um, results, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, in addition to the self-harm from the drug, talking about poisonings and 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 so on. Um, is there any information that you're aware of that's being collected about um, harm that might have been inflicted in the workplace to fellow workers or family members? Do we have a way to, to collect that data or connect it to this information? 
No. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's the short. That's the really quick short answer. Um, unfortunately, no. We don't have information. Again, um, administrative data. It's the limitation of what's collected in these administrative databases. But we don't actually have information on within what's happening in the workplaces of these individuals. Right. We're, um, we are. We are. Um, tr you know, one thing that we're looking at in the future is trying to get a hold of the coroner's uh, reports. Uh, and link this entire cohort to the coroner's reports. And that might give us some context information. Uh, but as Nancy said, with it, with the health outcome information, it doesn't really allow us uh, to connect to family or, or uh, people who are other workers within the same workplace. Okay, one of the um, listeners today is very interested in farming. Mm -hmm. um, and um, that the the emergency department visits versus hospitalizations um, for the mental and behavioral disorders um, in, in, in terms of uh, farming seem to be much higher in emergency departments compared to hospitalizations. Did, do you have any um, insights into what may be going on in this particular occupation? Yeah, and I'm trying to pull pull that up. I mean, it, it is a bit of a surprising result because people are very different. I mean, what ends up, you know, uh, I'll say that these things, the two different ones don't always line up. One is uh, we are looking at some geographic uh, differences here where people may be uh, in remote areas, perhaps are not, uh, you know, what kind of access to emergency rooms and hospitals might be different than people who are injured more in an urban area or closer to other healthcare facilities. Um, it, I mean, this is a dramatic difference that we see for the uh, farming and horticultural, but there's also the urgency of of, uh, of care, and perhaps because farmers uh, and people in agriculture may be, you know, needing to return to their work, um, and many of many of the these folks may be self-employed in terms of of being farmers or uh, may need to actually uh, kind of return to that work that could impact it as well. Unfortunately, we don't have, again, that kind of uh, information. Um, but I will point out that there are other things that are going on with people who live uh, more remote to, uh, to the healthcare system. And I, okay, I think you. not, I don't know if we can answer it in terms of farming in particular, but again, one of the things, as Paul had mentioned earlier, one thing to keep in mind is that people would have had to have survived long enough um, to reach an emergency department, but also to then be hospitalized. And we don't have information on mortality in this um, cohort at the moment. That is also something that we're trying um, to acquire. Um, so that's also another limitation is we don't really know what the outcome is um, and whether some people are just not making it into being admitted to hospital as well. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, by the way, a number of comments about what a great presentation. Um, so let me pass those along before the next question. Um, uh, several people are interested in next steps, um, particularly around uh, data collection in sort of new ways to understand the findings or in terms of knowledge translation. So let me ask about the data collection piece um, first. Um, so uh, one individual is uh, very interested in whether or not um, there uh, might be a potential to be looking more at prescribing behaviors, um, as well as WSIB um, education around narcotic prescription for WSIB claimants. Um, and the individual is quite shocked at how much is prescribed without any um, explanation um, and, and what it means to kind of transition to some of these um, narcotics and other pain meds. Do you want to comment on that, I, um, both or either of you? Um, I can start, and Paul, you can certainly jump in if there's anything that I missed. So, yeah, so I think one of the things that almost, all, quite often when we present these findings, people want to know about the prescribing, and especially because we're thinking about a worker's compensation um, cohort. So that is something that we're trying to also acquire. <laughs> There's a lot of attempts at the moment to try and enrich the data that we do have. And so prescribing data is something that we are also trying to um, link into the ODSS. I think um, for the most part, what I think it needs, we need more primary data collection in this space. 
you know, as I sort of mentioned, there are many hypothesized reasons for why we see study after study where we've seen all of these occupational patterns. Um, but I think we need more primary data collection of, of workers, of employers, um, of healthcare providers to really understand what's happening and why this is happening in these occupational um, groups, including things around prescribing. Paul, I'm not sure if you had anything to add. No, I think I think there's that's certainly an area that we want to look uh, look more into, and that's one area of kind of data uh, additional data linkage. You know, these getting access to each new database often takes uh, some time. Uh, we're not encountering a lot of uh, barriers in terms of uh, being told, oh no, you can't use this data. It's just approval processes take time. And then once we have approval, the data has to be transferred into Ontario Health, into our really secure area. And I will reassure everybody that it is, uh, it's one of the most secure areas to do this kind of analysis in the, uh, in the province of Ontario. Um, but all this takes kind of time for us to get the permissions and the data transfer and then to do the analyses. So uh, we are looking at um, analyses uh, that could certainly go beyond the end of this grant, unfortunately. <laughs> so we'll be looking for more extension of that in, in, the, in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, wondering about the distinction between poisoning and mental behavioral uh, uh, disorders. Um, while they were separate outcomes, they could be connected and linked to each other um, in that someone with a mental behavioral disorder may have more poisonings. Do you want to comment on your outcome and other outcomes and why these two were looked at um, and, and how interrelated or separate you think they are? Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, I think um, so poisonings are really around sort of a toxic amount in, in one's body and someone who is um, who experiences a poisoning likely does have a substance use disorder. And so there is probably a, a lot of degree of overlap between them. Um, we chose to go this route to sort of follow a lot of what we've seen um, done at a population level, um, looking at trends in, in, in these sorts of outcomes. Um, but I do agree that there is probably quite a bit of overlap. Now, what I think the other issue here is um, what gets coded in the data. So someone may be coded as a poisoning, but may not be coded as having a mental and behavioral disorder. Um, and so, so we sort of chose to kind of look at them both, but keeping in mind that I do agree that there's likely um, lots of overlap there. I should add for clarification, because it may not have been, it wasn't stated as I think strongly as I, I mean, it was probably mentioned, but these are not all mental and behavioral disorders. These are opioid related mental and behavioral disorders. Uh, so in terms of the cause and effect, um, they are closely linked, uh, but these are ones that are already mental behavioral disorders where they've recognized that it's an opioid relationship in them. Um, so, so what good. does that include, Paul and, and Nancy? Is, are those like addictions, or or what does that mean? Yeah, it can be like withdrawal, dependence. Um, again, it's sort of it's based on these ICD-10 codes. Um, but yes, addiction would fall in there, but it's not necessarily. I guess it could be. Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a mixed group. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, one of our listeners is asking, when you drill down into the occupational groups, there seemed to be a pattern. That is the subgroup with the lowered risk was higher skilled. So electricians within construction or air transport versus water transport, machinists versus other manufacturing. Um, do you have some interpretation? Do you agree with that? Um, you know, higher skill may be a proxy for SES. Um, does this sort of suggest some broader social determinants and equities playing a role in the differences between the subgroups? It certainly wouldn't surprise me, and I'll let Nancy probably has had some more, some more thoughts on that. Uh, I mean, one thing I will point out is that, you know, we do also see that, you know, uh, jobs in kind of medicine and health fields are right about at the average uh, when we're comparing uh, to the general population. Uh, so it isn't consistent across the board, but I think that socioeconomic status is definitely something worth looking at to see what kind of an internal gradient that we see with that. 
uh, to the extent that we can do that, because all we really have is people's occupation and occupation is a surrogate for so many different things, uh, not just socioeconomic status in this case. We don't have people's income or education or things like that. Yeah, and I think again, it just speaks to, um, it just speaks to the need, I think, for more, more data in this space and to, to really unpack what we're seeing. Um, some of it can be a bit tricky to, to interpret. Um, so we can sort of see these signals, but we don't necessarily understand exactly why. And it could be, uh, I suspect it's a complex interplay of a number of different um, factors that might be going on, SES being potentially one of, one of the issues. And uh, someone has a follow-up and has actually proposed one additional factor in, um, for your comment. And that's um, in air transport with the lower risk. Um, these individuals often have extensive medical surveillance requirements um, as part of their jobs. And wonders if you think that surveillance uh, in general, uh, greater surveillance uh, for higher risk populations is part of maybe the solution to deal with some of these uh, findings. I mean, I agree that that could be impacting uh, uh, that that group in particular, uh, air traffic. The thing is, we can't really be doing kind of things like drug testing on, on the entire population. I'm not sure that that's, there are other implications that we have here for opioid related harms. And that is identifying groups at high risk can, can help us kind of target groups where education may be helpful. It may target groups where, having uh, naloxone kits available uh, to when they're, they're in a more of an isolated workplace to make sure that uh, people can be treated immediately when they are poisoned. So there are a lot of good prevention implications that I think can come out of this work. Um, but uh, it's true though that in the interpretation of air, I think that that's a, that's a valid one. There are not that many groups that are uh, monitored uh, as closely as that. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything, Nancy, to add? Nope. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so in you put up one of your uh, later slides was um, about some of the other things that may be going on here. Um, you noted the male-dominated occupations, um, you, uh, substance use and, and workplace norms, uh, work environment, and, and possibly disclosure concerns. Can you speak to um, some of those explanations, uh, both in terms of what you might want to be doing as part of your team going forward to understand them, um, and or whether or not right now there should be some targeted knowledge translation and exchange or awareness um, that might um, help um, to uh, inform this area. Sorry, can you just so repeat the first the part yeah. is, does your team have um, plans to to try to understand some of those other explanations that you gave us um, for why we're seeing some of these findings, um, something or, or that, you know, to understand them better, something about gender in male dominated occupations or norms, um, yeah. disclosure, um, are you going to look at some of these issues? So at the moment, this so the funding that we have for this project is really about looking at the ODSS, but certainly um, that would be something um, that I think would be an, uh, an appropriate follow up, right? And again, speaking to the idea that we need to go beyond administrative data and start to think about doing some primary data collection in this space to try to unpack some of this and to try to understand what's happening. And I sort of see that as being a bit of a mixed method. So doing some qualitative work, um, you know, maybe with some workers who are, have experienced, um, you know, re are recovering from opioid related issues, um, but also sort of quantitative, um, you know, surveys, interviews. Um, so that's certainly something on the, you know, I can kind of see on the horizon, but it's not something that we're currently funded for <laughs> um, at the moment. Okay. I'll, um, I'll just add one thing. Yeah. We are we are going to look at we we have looked at the the separate results for uh, for males and females within this population. It's just yeah. um, there's so many results. There's only so much you can put into a uh, a single uh, presentation. But those I think will also be available on the um, using the interactive tool on the website. 
So maybe for a, a sneak peek, are the findings complex so that you can't sum them in a, a quick in between men and women, or are they? Are you seeing something that uh, um, you can share with us? So off the top of my head, <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I I mean, I remember that there were a couple of differences. I do remember. Um, I believe it was service. Um, we tended to see risks, higher risks among females than among males. Um, we haven't gone as far as being able to interpret this yet. So this is just, but we do see some differences by sex. Um, keeping in mind this is sex at, at birth. We don't have information beyond that. Um, but those are things that we were start, sort of starting to explore now are those differences that we've been seeing. Okay. Um I'm, I'm not going to get a chance to ask all the questions, so just wanted to say again to anyone who doesn't get their question answered, if you want to reach out to Nancy and Paul, please do. They would be uh, delighted to speak with you. Um, but uh, a question here um, around um, whether or not the duration of the claim, the injury claim, is associated to elevated risks for poisoning or uh, mental and behavioral disorders. Do you have information about that? Unfortunately, no, <laughs> okay. um, which is interesting because in those other two studies that I mentioned, we do see um, that the risks were higher among individuals with lost, um, with a longer duration or sort of uh, lost time claim. So I suspect that longer duration may be playing a role in this as well. Um, but we don't have that data at the moment in the ODSS. I don't know if you wanted to speak any more to that, Paul. Yeah, I mean, we could probably have the length of hospitalization. And one thing that we've been thinking about is uh, doing an additional analysis by the severity of injury based upon that, the type of injury. And uh, we're already doing analyses by the overall category of injury, but also by uh, length of hospitalization. Uh, but the way that the system was set up in our agreement with the WSIB and creating the system really was to focus in on creating a large population with occupation and industry and not really focusing so much on the nature of the claim because the purpose that we set up the ODSS for was not, we, we didn't have this in mind when we set this up many years ago. Uh, it may be something that we could explore in the future. Okay. And I think that's a, a great way to maybe finish up that this is um, really highlights. Thank you for the interesting presentation that, that highlights the ways to use data, to link data, to really help us to move forward in understanding questions, to raise new areas where there are gaps. And so thank you both for your presentation today. I want to thank everyone who attended. Um, and um, if you uh, missed the beginning, we are going on a little bit of a summer break. We won't have a talk in July or August, but we will be back in September on September 19th when Dr. Linda Robson will talk about the effectiveness of different methods of Joint Health and Safety Committee uh, certify, uh, certification training. If you aren't already getting alerts from us, please do, please do sign up for them and um, you'll hear more about our talks. And thank you so very, very much, Paul and Nancy, for a terrific presentation today. Thank you, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank